Today, I'd like to talk about a creature that embodies a journey of struggle to survival to triumph. Today, I'd like to talk about sea turtles. For starters, here are a few cool facts. First, after hatching and entering the water, up to the first decade of a baby sea turtle's life is known as the lost years. This time consists of travel and maturation, yet scientists don't actually know where they go or what happens in a sea turtle's life. Second, it is estimated that only one out of every thousand sea turtles make it to adulthood. And third, those that do survive can live up to an average of 100 years, and they cross oceans many times over. Now, I'm no herpetologist or test immunologist. In fact, the only thing I'm an expert at is surviving. So in doing research for this presentation, I came across an article titled, If you are born a sea turtle, the odds are never in your favor. And although statistically I know that, I didn't know whether to take the title as encouraging or disheartening to think about. You see, sea turtles have always been my analogy to tell my story. They're my spirit animal, per se. It is true. Until maturation around age 20, sea turtles are in a fight for their life they are not likely to win. And yet some do. And those who survive grow old and wise, flying through the ocean with beauty, grace, and expertise. My name is Lainey Corrado, and as an expert in surviving things I shouldn't have, I'd like to share my lost years with you all today to show you that the fight for life is worth it. Now, would you believe me if I told you I graduated high school when I was 16? Would you believe me if I told you I got my first college degree the same year I got my driver's license? Would you believe me if I told you that less than one year ago, I was admitted to the hospital and told what the path I was on I had two weeks to live? All of these are true. I am 19 years old, I'm a junior in college, I've stared death in the face, and I chose to come back. You see, like a snake that preys on young turtles, anorexia nervosa crept into my life when I was only nine years old. Now, I've been told by several professionals that I'm the poster child for developing an eating disorder. But how could this be when I was spending my existence trying to be the poster child for a student, an athlete, a caretaker, literally anything that would show the world I was doing what I was supposed to? Well, that's how it started. When I was nine, I didn't even know what an eating disorder was. I knew food was something special. It had rules. It could be earned as a reward or it could be lost as a punishment. I knew a meal was complete when there was a vegetable, a protein, and a starch present. I know my family is Italian, so one of the ways we show love is by making food for somebody else. Oh, you don't feel good? Here's some of Nana's magical soup to make you feel better. Oh, you're having a rough day? Let's bake something warm together to make it better. Do you want to play something with all of your siblings? Let's have a cooking competition. Food has this magical way to bring people together and convey a message of love and care. So then how did food become my enemy? Simple, it didn't. Food was not the root of the problem. It was merely the means through which I communicated I was struggling. So then, how did what start as a food game end up taking my life almost a decade later? Well, first, let's start and look at some of the risk factors for developing an eating disorder. First and foremost, genetics. There is a biological predisposition. Although it is common thought that eating disorders are of sociocultural origin, it is genetics that load the gun and the environment forms the trigger. It is important to note that just as death does not discriminate, neither do eating disorders, no matter your race, gender, or socioeconomic level. And although statistically we do see higher fluctuations in certain demographics, that does not discredit the very real battle of any given individual who is struggling. Next, we have psychological factors such as perfectionism or behavior and flexibility. We also have a familial or personal history of anxiety, depression, or eating disorders. Then we have our commonly attributed factors such as thin idealization in the media, social pressure, negative affect, parental separation, and maladaptive coping. And finally, we have the combination of social and environmental factors such as trauma. At the onset of my eating disorder, I checked that box with a face only once. Now I stand here as a survivor of the Me Too movement, eight faces over. Now I'm all for making a list to check things off to feel accomplished, but not for something that carried the stigma that because I was struggling, that meant I was a bad person or attention seeking. It was more than waking up one morning and deciding not to eat, and it was bigger than what could be fixed with just eat a burger. So then how did it end up this far? 
Well, here's how it went. Age nine, I started by skipping meals in order to eat fewer numbers than the day before. Adding on age 10 and 11, nighttime wasn't for sleep anymore. It was for exercising in the dark, despite being active the majority of the day. Self-punishment went from digging in nails and biting skin to sketching tally marks across my flesh-covered battlefield. Age 12, disappointment in myself for failing to comply with the screeching in my head led me to look for new answers, face down in a toilet bowl. Age 13, it still wasn't enough. On my six mile a day runs, I would go to the drugstore and scan the weight loss aisle for diet pills. Ones I didn't think would do too much damage, but would be enough to tell the voices constantly telling me I was worthless, that at least I was trying to be worth something. Age 14, all caution to the wind. I upgraded my diet pills to a brand that was about to be taken off the shelf due to the damages it caused. I also began inhaling handfuls of laxatives. And in this year was my first of many attempts to take my own life. Five years in, each year adding another layer of destruction, my body had had enough. A broken ankle, fractured foot, pulled ACL, I was forced to stop exercising. Two months of not healing later, I was diagnosed with Lyme disease. Turned out to be the perfect cover for my eating disorder. Over the next four months, I was in and out of the hospital every other weekend for heart problems, MRIs, x-rays. I was known by name in three different ERs. Then it all came to a head. We were on a trip for my sister's 16th birthday, and my mom found my stash of diet pills. Upon returning home and realizing she had taken them, I pulled out a bottle of 500 sleeping pills and locked my doors. That night, my mom saved my life. The next day, I was admitted to a hospital for my first foray into treatment. Now, it didn't last long. In all honesty, I complied my way out. I was desperate to regain some form of control over my life again. Then after doubling my previous weight loss in only two months, my options were either get sent across the country for more treatment or work super hard outpatient. My super smart but very malnourished and irrational brain did neither. I simply got better at hiding my disorder. Over those next few years, I went from being homeschooled to public school, started college, graduated high school, worked three to four jobs simultaneously, and I was gradually dying. I had no social life. Free time alone was spent pushing my body to its limits. More and more trips to the gym were getting cut short from fainting and falling off the stair climber. I'd lost my ability to focus and read. I was no longer able to communicate properly with others. And I wasn't able to stand for more than a few minutes at a time to the point where the only way I was allowed to participate in family vacations was confined to a wheelchair. Anorexia robbed me of my happiness and memory of jo and joy of visiting my sister. She robbed me of dancing and performing front and center on the 50-yard line at the Outback Bowl. She stole from me my happiness in renting my room for research at an honors conference. In March, my Nana and I bought a pair of shoes to wear to my associate's degree graduation. Those shoes still sit at the top of my closet, unworn, for I was not able to attend. You see, in April of last year, my body couldn't take anything anymore, and I was admitted to the hospital, where on the very first night, I went code blue. My mom, who's my angel, and she's literally walked with me every step of the way, she was there that night, and she told me about it kind of like a Grey's Anatomy episode. I went down where they were trying to put a tube in, and it was unresponsive. The nurse hit the code blue button, and within seconds, my room was filled with doctors, nurses, interns, AED machines, social workers, the whole nine yards. Eventually, I came to, but my heart rate had dropped again in the 20s. The next hour was a blur of complication and medications. My mom, who was sadly growing accustomed to seeing her daughter like this, stayed calm, but she told me what I needed to hear. Laney, she said, you need to fight. There's a problem getting a feeding tube in, but I wasn't allowed to go to sleep until the drip had started. So I sat up, asked if I could try, and put the feeding tube in myself. At that point, I began to fight. After that hospitalization, I was transferred to another treatment program where I would spend my second consecutive summer of missed birthdays, swim, miss family trips, miss weddings. I missed out on so much. If, but if I had missed out on that in one summer, how much have I missed in 10 years of fighting? To tell you the truth, I don't know. My body and brain have been so deprived during that time that what I call memories are just bits and pieces of stories and pictures others have shared with me. This by no means is actually living. 
It barely qualifies as surviving. But still, I couldn't see that. In August of this year, I discharged from my most recent treatment program. And I get to stand here in front of you, less than a year later, to tell you the story of a turtle fighting against the odds. I am by no means recovered, but I'm fighting to live every day in some form of active recovery, whether it be by participating in little things of self-harm, reaching out to friends or family for support, contacting my treatment team, or simply getting out of bed every morning. I may be in a dance of three steps forward, two steps backwards, but eventually, I will break through this rough current. It is common thought to attribute sea turtles to pull their head, arms, and legs inside their shell for survival. However, that is not the case. Just like one cannot simply eat to get over an eating disorder, turtles have to face their problems head on. They take on the snakes that try to creep in and lure them away from the ocean. It just like anorexia came to me, pulling me closer to my death with empty promises of sweet nothings. They make it past the ghost crabs and the seabirds that leave a turtle lying violated on its back with no hope of continuing on. Like the way the hands of another person, perhaps even one you trust, can leave you feeling lost and alone with nothing left to give. They push past the pollution-filled water like the shame and the guilt I had to get through in order to seek help. They make it past the shallow waters and the big fish that leave behind scrapes, cuts, and cracks, like the scars that still mark my body from the times I'd lost all feeling and desperately needed proof I was alive. Then after their struggle and their lost years, they return home to nest in the same location they were born. Just like although I've been in my fight in lost years for some time, by the grace of God, I am that one in 1,000 that is working on returning home to tell my story in my travels across the sea. Now, I know I said I was an expert in surviving, and it's true. I have a 100% survival rate, but I've also been talking about turtles. So let me share with you today my tips for survival through the analogy of turtles. <laughs> Number one, obstacles are inevitable, but keep going. Sea turtles don't know when their predators are coming or what they're going to have to face next, and yet they keep going. When a situation is scary, we can choose to be overwhelmed by it or accept it for what it is and figure out how to move forward. Number two, support is not a sign of weakness. Sea turtles are an endangered species, and without the help of outside human protection, they will go extinct. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Something I didn't understand in the depths of my disorder was that the stigma and stereotyping of people and their families with eating disorders was a construct I bought into that ultimately kept me sick. My disease was not a result of neglectful parenting. I was not being self-centered. I was not attention-seeking. I was sick. And when you're sick or hurt, say a broken foot, do people tell you to get over it, to just walk, that you're a horrible person because of a malfunction in your skeletal structure? No, they don't. They tell you to rest, to take time to take care of yourself and recover. And mental illness should be viewed no differently. As previously stated, there is a biological predisposition to developing an eating disorder. And nowadays, society as a whole is much more open to talking about it and understanding that this disease is not a desire to be thin. It is a maladaptive coping mechanism for survival. And because of that, it is critical to reach out and ask for support. This can be found in places such as Crisis Lines, the National Eating Disorders Association website, local therapists, or even the website most treatment programs have resources and ways you can rece receive help. If you are struggling, you are not alone. People will walk with you every step of the way. I have the most amazing support system made up of friends and family who call me out when I lose my way, but they welcome me back with open arms. When I was at my lowest and when I thought was broken beyond repair, I laid down my control and said, Father, it's in your hands now. Which brings me to number three. You are worthy. If God can spend so much time to take care of an inch-long baby sea turtle, imagine the plans he has for you. I've been told over and over by medical professionals that they have no idea how I'm alive or how I survived. But I choose to believe that it's because God has bigger plans for me. Something I am still slowly learning. And if you are struggling in any way, please take this with you. Simply being here 
and being alive means you are worthy of every good this world has to offer. And lastly, number four, resiliency is key. Sea turtles have been around for billions of years. They outlived the dinosaurs. We as humans are far more resilient than we will ever know. And I'm not saying go test out how strong or unbreakable your physical being is, but know that whatever you come to, you have the ability to recover and move forward. When a baby sea turtle hatches, all it knows is to listen to its primal instinct to follow the light to get to the sea. And when she gets there, despite her struggle and her lost years, she will find her way home. All she has to do is just keep swimming. Thank you so much.